I was 13 years old. I was walking down the street with two of my friends, and we were heading to a park in the neighborhood across a busy street from my neighborhood, the direction we were coming from. Right after we crossed the street, this beat-up suburban drives by and someone in the car yells out, Drugs or dick? We kind of looked at each other puzzled, shrugged it off, and kept on walking. Not too long after that, the suburban made another appearance right in front of our path. One of my friends I was with recognized one of the guys inside as being one of her neighbors. She seemed to be flirting with him. She drew a smiley face on his arm with a sharpie, and suddenly he flipped his shit. As in he got out of the suburban, threw her basically into this nearby ditch, and took that sharpie and drew all over her. All over her face, or arms, or any skin that was exposed. That was so off-putting and I really didn't know how to react to it. Let's call this friend that's now in the ditch Anna. Hannah laid there for a bit, clearly bewildered, but she didn't seem that hurt. My second friend who was there that we'll call Andrew was behind this suburban clearly freaked out. I was between him and Anna, kind of right next to the suburban. Andrew and I are trying to make sure Anna is okay while also still being really unsure of what to expect from these guys. All of a sudden, the driver gets out and picks me up, slings me over his shoulders and just throws me in the back, through the double doors. I didn't see that coming at all. Both guys get back into the suburban and they start driving off. I'm pretty much in shock and I look back and see Anna and Andrew in complete shock as well, wondering if these guys were joking or how serious this matter would become. I look around me and the first thing that I see was what I would later find out to be a potato launcher. I also saw a baseball bat, rope, and lots of tools. There was only one seat in the back, behind the passenger seat in the main cab, and that's where I sat. I was trying really hard to pay attention to where we were going, so I would know how to get back to safety. Meanwhile, these guys are talking to each other like I'm not even there, asking each other if there's a good spot to r somebody and other fucked up things like that. At some point, they offer me a drink or something. It's in a water bottle, and the liquid is slightly opaque, and I assume it's drugs. So, in my super adrenaline state, I say yes, but I take the drink and immediately throw it out the open window. That was not wise. I was thinking I could take getting beat up, but I couldn't fight back if I was drugged, so fuck that scenario even happening. Fast forward a little bit, and they pull into a secluded park. The kind of park you might drive by a million times and not even know it was there. The view of the park was shielded from the main road by a huge line of dense trees. This was my first time learning about the park. I noticed one car in the parking lot as they were pulling in. It's a family with two small children packing up and getting ready to leave. The two guys just keep going past the parking lot and pull to the very end of this park, and they were driving on grass to get there. They stop, get out, and are totally ignoring me at this point, or acting like I'm so insignificant and such a non-threat to them. They're just sharing a cigarette and talking about whatever in front of the Suburban. I'm still in the seat behind the main passenger seat at this point, and I notice the door is locked but the window is down. I think for a second, and then I just jump out of that window and fucking run like wind towards the car and family that I had seen at the front of the park. I make it to them. They call 911. The two guys got in their suburban and chase after me, of course, but I managed to dodge them by zigzag running in front of them. They leave the park once they see me talking to that family. The cops come, and for some fucking reason, they came back to the park. I guess they couldn't tell the cops were there from the road, once they saw the cops, the cops saw them, so they got caught. They were in jail for about two weeks, and then they got two years of probation. But then, one day I'm walking from my house to check the mail, as the box was down the street, and what do I see but none other than that fucking suburban. It turns out that one of the guys moved in two houses down from me, and I was like hell fucking no, and got a restraining order really quick. I still saw that suburban around town from time to time, and yes, it terrified me. I found out a couple of years later from Anna that that guy down the street had died from an overdose. I wasn't sad at all. I haven't relived that experience in my mind in very many years. God damn, it's crazy just how my adrenaline starts to flow thinking about it all. A few years ago I was in Prague with a couple of my friends. We were backpacking across Eastern Europe and Prague was the second stop. It had been a long train ride in from Amsterdam, so we went out to start celebrating quite early. I, in particular, probably went a little too hard, a little too fast. By 10pm, I was quite drunk, and the constant smoking amplified my feels for the day. There were also a few shots of absinthe taken, and there's always a debate whether they make you hallucinate or not, but there's not a debate that they make you shit-faced drunk. The next few parts of the night are still a blur, but somehow I left my friends and found myself walking around on the street outside the bar we had been in. 
Something happened, rather I probably did something, that started an altercation of sorts with a random stranger. We were able to mesh it quite peacefully, but not until after some loud noises were exchanged and we caused quite a scene. I decided to walk away to just kind of get myself away from the scene in case any more trouble arrived. I was walking down a quiet side alley that I remembered from earlier in the day that led to my hotel when an unmarked white van creeped past me. Now mind you, my friends and I had idiotically just watched all two of the Hostel movies before we had left for Europe, so that whole kidnapping thing was still fresh in my mind. I started walking faster and faster. I almost came to a running pace when I thought I was just overreacting and that van was long gone. Less than a few seconds later though, I hear brakes screeching behind me and turn to see three large guys running toward me and the same white van parked right behind them. They grabbed me and threw me inside the van before I even knew what was up. I was completely shit scared at this point and tried to reason with the four guys in the van, but they didn't speak a lick of English, or at least didn't respond to my pleas. We drove a few blocks until we came to a stoplight, and I decided then and there that this was my last chance to make a break for it or else I was completely fucked. I dove over one of the guys sitting next to me and straight out the van door that I somehow managed to open fairly quickly. I got maybe half a block before the guy caught up to me and tackled me down to the ground. I frantically looked around and tried to scream for any onlookers to help me, but of course there was no one around to be seen. This time they handcuffed me in the van the rest of the way. We got to some building and it was very torn down, and the hallways we walked in looked old and dilapidated. I was still freaking out too much to think sanely or get any real bearing of this place. They tried talking to me for a bit, but I couldn't really make out any of the few English words they said to me, so instead they took me to a prison cell-esque room and started tying me down on a bed. There was blood on the headrest of this bed, and this was the moment I started realizing that something really bad was going to happen to me from that point on. They left to go do something for a few minutes, and in those few minutes it was life or death time for me. Still, to this day, I look back at those few minutes and really admire myself and what I tried to do. You always think that when you're in a life or death situation, you will fight to survive any which way you can, but you really don't know until you're actually in one. I started trying to take off my straps immediately. There were two on my wrists and two around my ankles. I kicked and wiggled and did everything that was humanly possible to get out of those leather shackles. I was able to get off the two from my feet within a few minutes and started focusing everything I had on my wrists. I have never fought harder to do anything in my entire life. I was fully convinced that in a few minutes, I would be dead if I didn't get this done right at that exact moment. Somehow, I was able to get those shackles off my wrists while skinning them in the process. I had blood pouring out of my cuts from both my wrists and ankles, but I was free of them. I went over to the window and punched right through it, but to my utter dismay, there were bars right behind it. There was nothing I could do. I was completely trapped with no chance to escape. My captors heard the commotion and came running into the room. They grabbed me and tied me down to the bed again, and this time put one strap over my chest, leaving me effectively unable to wiggle or move. This was it. I was fucking done for. In the next few moments, I made peace with death for the first time in my life. A beautiful wave of peace washed over my entire body, and I laid in my bed feeling completely okay with the world. I thought about my parents and my friends, and hoped that they would at least learn of my death and not left wondering what happened to me. I thought about my dog, and hoped that she wouldn't think that I just abandoned her. I thought about quite a few things, but all with a peaceful heart. An hour, or what felt like an hour, passed and no one came. I thought for sure that they would have been skinning me alive at this point, or whatever sick torture device they would have chosen for me. This was also around the time I started getting sober, and that damn absence started leaving my mind. A few things I had previously been oblivious to started coming into focus. This place I was in wasn't as dilapidated or abandoned as I had previously thought. I could hear noises of people coming from down the hallway, and it reminded me of a public place, not a dilapidated kill house that I had convinced myself I was in. The street outside my now broken window also seemed quite alive. It was around this time that two of my captors decided to come into my room again, and I started realizing that they weren't going to kill me. They came into my room wearing raggedy looking lab coats, but on these coats were also name tags. The next few minutes, everything started making a little sense. They gave me a breathalyzer, cleaned up my cuts, and bandaged them. Afterwards, they took me out to a waiting room with quite a few people in it, gave me my clothes back, as well as a nice ticket for public intoxication and a hefty bill for my stay. A couple things I've learned from my first stay in Prague prison, or hospital. I'm never drinking absinthe ever again. I'm never watching fucked up movies that scare the crap out of me before a vacation. And that I'm pretty sure that if or when I'm in an actual life or death situation, 
I will have the will to fight for my survival. That was the most fucked up night ever, and the strongest instance of fear that I've ever felt. I can't say for certain this was an attempted kidnapping, but it freaked the fuck out of me as a child. I was visiting the West Edmonton Mall with my parents and godparents and their older son Steve. This was the mid-80s and I was 10. The adults left me with Steve, he was about 15 or 16, and went off to do their own thing for the day. Steve was stuck chaperoning me through the mall. He met up with three of his buddies and I remember one of them whispering about ditching me so they could go smoke some weed and chase some girls. Steve wouldn't let them though, as his parents would have killed him. So they were stuck with me and I was bored as hell as they dragged me through all the quote, teen cool shops. I was basically trailing after them. They didn't want to be seen with this little kid and didn't really want much to do with me. In one store, I started feeling like I was being watched. I turned around and this middle-aged dude was staring at me with this creepy smile. We ended up going to a few more stores and he just kept following me. I was starting to get scared but I didn't want to say anything to Steve and his buddies because I thought they'd make fun of me. I told the guys I needed to use the washroom instead. I figured the creepy guy would get bored and leave me alone in there. I was wrong. He followed me into the bathroom and stood outside the stall staring through the crack. I was freaking the fuck out. Fortunately, one of Steve's friends came into the washroom. I don't know if he noticed something was weird when the guy followed me into the bathroom, or if there was another reason he came in, but thank fuck he did. There was a hushed confrontation outside the stall and the creep just left. After that, the guys literally circled all around me and we spent the rest of the day with me in the middle and all of them with their heads on a swivel. I was kidnapped when I was seven. It was by a very drug-ridden family member who told me he was bringing me out for some ice cream. He left me on a bench outside of a bar when the bartender told him he couldn't bring kids inside. It was a dirty biker bar in Las Vegas during the 90s. I was young, scared, and didn't fully comprehend the situation, and I was just confused why we didn't go to the ice cream shop. The family member eventually came out of the bar with two men that fully fucking terrified me. One of them touched my curly bright red hair and smiled wide. I remember not knowing what to do, so I started to scream saying, Joan Osborne's, what if God was one of us? They got freaked when I wouldn't stop singing and walked back into the bar. I was definitely a weird kid, but scream singing as a self-defense was kind of smart. I was left alone on the bench again when a man walked up and asked me where my parents were. I told him that I didn't get ice cream and I wanted to go back to my mom, but my family member wouldn't let me. He walked into the bar, but came out just a minute later and sat with me until the police arrived. 20 years later, my mom saw that family member again for the first time. He was on end-of-life hospice care, but made it to another family member's funeral. When everyone was filtering out, he was waiting on the bus home when my mom punched him in the face. I love my mom. I got kidnapped by a Jordanian tow truck driver in LA when I was 21. I was visiting some friends and I lived a few hours away from LA and had driven there in my beat up, decades old Honda Accord. On the way home, after about 10 minutes, it just shit the bed and stopped working. I had to call a tow truck, nothing that unusual yet. After waiting for a long time, a tow truck finally came, hooked up my car and asked where I wanted it. I told him to just drop it off at the nearest shop, I didn't care which one, but the tow truck driver was very insistent I needed the name. This was before smartphone, so it came out that I wasn't a local and didn't know the places around. He eventually just takes my car to a shop, I tell him thanks, and that I'll just hop out and wait for my friends with my car. He insists that he'll not leave me there. There's too many Mexicans, he says. It's not safe. We go back and forth on this for a few times until I just try to open the door and it doesn't budge. It won't open. Fuck. It's a holiday weekend and all my friends are drunk or out of town. I'm surreptitiously trying to find anyone via text while I'm driving around stuck in this tow truck with this guy. He has this Jordan flag in his cab, and he's offering me gifts and perfumes and cars, telling me about his wife Sarah and how he's looking for a second wife. I never wished that I spoke Arabic until then, I'm pretty sure that was what he was speaking. Ironically, a lot of my friends spoke it in other Middle Eastern languages, so I could identify the broader category, if not dialects. He's calling people and saying words that I don't know. At one point he asks to kiss me, I say no, and he tries to anyway, so I put my hand on his neck and squeeze to get the message across, my other hand on my pocket knife, the one thing keeping me feel somewhat okay in all of this. He gets pouty and petulant, but that's about the end of that. 
Eventually, we end up at a seedy motel where he opens the door, helps me down, clamps a hand on my shoulder, and leads me to a room. He explains that he knows the owner of the motel and is going to tell him something or whatever, and that he'll be right back. I watch him disappear around the corner via the people, then I fucking run to a nearby gas station where I'm finally able to get in touch with a friend who can be there in a few hours to get me. I let the attendant know that I was avoiding someone, I hid out there until my friend got me, and I had a guy friend of mine pick up the car since the tow truck driver knew it was there. Definitely one of the top three legitimately scary times of my life. This was just an attempt. I live in a quiet neighborhood up the streets from a nice private university. Most of my neighbors have lived in the area for at least 5-10 to ten years. My landlord has owned my house for 34 years at that point. After finishing a bottle of wine and deciding we were in the mood for a second one, I volunteered to walk to the corner liquor store, less than 3,000 feet away, and grab one. I didn't even bother locking the front door or bringing my phone since I've done it a million times. As I'm walking in the dark along some bushes, a guy pulls up next to me and asks if I need a ride. I say no thanks, he speeds off and leaves. A few seconds later, I hear tires squealing and see the car coming back from the opposite direction. The tires squeal again and I hear the engine rev. I broke out running at full pace with this car following me the whole time. By the time I arrived at the liquor store, the girl inside sees the panic on my face and locks the front door and calls the cops. The guy was just sitting outside, staring in. The cops arrived about 10 minutes later in time for him to drive off. Since he hadn't done anything illegal at that point, I doubt they were able to ticket him. After he buzzed off, I waited a few minutes in time to see a neighbor heading into the convenience store and had him walk me home. I'm not sure what would have happened to me, but I always drive when I head over now. So, my quote-unquote uncle, not really related but a longtime friend of my dad, was kidnapped in Mexico City. We call this type of kidnapping an express kidnapping, because they will just drive around town looking for random people to kidnap for either ransom or organ extraction. Well, he got kidnapped on a Tuesday, I believe. They held him in a room for about three days or so. Unlucky for him, he was kidnapped to take his organs. All of them. They had a doctor there that would do a full checkup on him to make sure he was healthy. Well, luckily for him, the doctor told them that he had cancer everywhere and he was unusable. He told them he was going to die probably in a couple months anyway, so there was no reason to kill him. They took him out of the city onto the highway in between Mexico City and Mexico State. They literally threw him in a ditch and left him there. They told him if they ever see him again, they were going to kill him. He eventually managed to find a ride home and return to his family. Here's the crazy part. He heard the doctor talk about his cancer and whatnot. So he went to the hospital once he was back, and enough time had passed so he felt safe going outside. While at the hospital, he got a full checkup, and to his surprise, he was completely healthy. There was no sign of cancer or anything. To this day, we don't know if the doctor felt pity for him, or there was a mistake on the test, but he got really lucky, and he survived imminent death. We haven't seen or heard from him in a while though, because after all this, he decided to move cities and stay off the radar, because of the fear of the kidnappers finding out about him. He comes to town once every five years or so, but even then he only stays for a couple of days. I got very, very lucky. The two men who kidnapped me from a bus stop, I was only 16 at the time, had clearly done so with others before. They'd removed the door handles from the backseat doors, so when I tried to make my way out at a red light, I couldn't get the door open. I'm pretty sure they intended to kill me after they me. They drove me to an abandoned gas station and began assaulting me, but about an hour into the experience, a police car drove up to check out what was happening. The man in the back seat with me at the time threatened to slit my throat if I screamed, while his partner got out and convinced the cop that I was his niece, and that he and my quote dad brought me out to talk with me. He said they needed to set me straight because I had been acting out. The cop insisted they leave the station right then, and he followed our car back out to the highway. They got so worried that he'd remember them if my body turned up the next day that they decided to release me right there and then. I got thrown down a gravel embankment along the highway and then ran in the dark to a nearby open restaurant. I will never forget lying there in that wet grass after coming to a rest at the bottom of the embankment, gazing up at a sky filled with stars and realizing that, holy shit, I was somehow still alive. I was injured, anguished, violated, and sorrowful, but I was alive and I was able to find a way through the trauma.
I was walking home from the bus stop, a little over half a mile or about a kilometer away from my house, on a chilly November day in suburbia, when a minivan pulls up alongside me and the driver, a guy I had never seen before who looked to be in his mid-fifties, rolls down his window, asking me if I want to ride. Naturally, I said no, but he insisted, rolling his car alongside me as I continued to walk. I remember he called me Little Girl, which was weird to me because I had hit puberty at like age 9 and was always getting mistaken for a high schooler, but the Catholic school uniform might have made me look younger. I don't really know. He kept this up until I said, Look, I'm not going with you. Please, leave me alone. At that point, he pulled into a driveway in front of me to block me, and another guy, probably in his early 20s, opened the door and started jumping out toward me. Of course, this was before everyone had cell phones, so I couldn't call the police or anything. I just ran as fast as I could away from them while screaming and hoping it would scare them off. I ended up cutting through the park on that street and zigzagging my way through backyards to get to my house. It turns out that the guy was a registered sex offender who lived only a few streets away from my bus stop. My dad filed a police report, but we never heard anything back about it. There were younger kids and my younger siblings who usually were there with me, so I'm not sure what would have happened if they had been there that day too. Would the men still have tried to take someone? Or would they have been intimidated by the group? It's scary to think about what could have happened. When I was a child, my parents fostered. One of the families they provided respite for was a young woman, we'll call her Helen, who had left her abusive husband and was living with her new man, we'll call him Paris. Helen had a son, A, with her husband who she'd taken with her when she fled and two other children with Paris, another son, B, and a daughter, C. Helen was also convinced that her husband would not stop until he found and killed her, which was probably one of the reasons she hooked up with Paris, who was a giant grizzly bear of a man, living off the grid in the mountains, and who did not hesitate to shoot wolves, bears, or trespassers. Now, as I say, I was very young when we were involved in all of this, and a lot of subtext went over my head at the time. I only knew that once a month or so, Helen's kids came to stay with us for the weekend, and every so often, my siblings and I would go stay with them in their camping cabin in the woods. I remember Helen as nervous, but a good mom, and Paris as huge and a little scary looking, but really cool, like something out of the movies. It was only for a few years, and then, as it happened with a lot of the kids my parents fostered, we didn't see them anymore. I didn't think much of it, but after a few more years, I mentioned them to my mom and asked why we never visited them anymore. I mean, I got that they weren't providing state respite anymore, but they were friends, right? Why didn't we ever visit? She then got very serious and told me that the family had moved and didn't want to be found. Then she told me some of the family history that I had been a little too young and naive to pick up on when I was younger. And then she told me the rest of the story. It turns out Helen's husband did find her. And one day, he came by while Paris was out and beat the ever-living shit out of her. He left her on the floor, possibly thinking she was dead, and took his son, A, and the brother, B, to keep A company. He later said, though, that he had no interest in the other boy. He just left the sister, C, behind with her mother. He then proceeded to flee across the country, staying in campgrounds and cheap motels. He drank a lot and was saying things like A was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ, which slowly began to morph into suggesting that in order to balance out the universe, A might also need to die, but only to come back to life three days later and complete his divine transformation. So it's not murder or anything. The boys were 12 and 10, and really had no way to escape or ask anyone for help. But one day, A found a postage stamp. He took a piece of paper from one of the motels they were staying at, wrote his name and address on it, said where they were and what day it was, what car they were driving, the license plate, everything he could think of, and put the stamp on it. Somehow, he was able to sneak this letter into a mail drop box, and either it was delivered, or the mailman who picked it up realized what he had and turned it over to the police. But the end result was the cops found the guy, and the two boys, alive. The man was arrested, but the whole thing was more or less dismissed as a custody dispute. But the boys were returned to their mother initially, but the state ordered visitations. I guess the kids were not considered good witnesses? I'm really not sure what happened there. But the whole family vanished soon after that. Helen did reach out to my mom just to let her know that the boys were home and safe, but as far as I know, that was the last time their family spoke to ours. Helen believed, and my mom agreed, that it was probably better that they not be found. <laughs>